Yeah, hi everyone. Sorry it's so uh, hot in this room. Um, I cannot do anything about it. The, uh, uh, I guess the first question is how many of you are familiar with Fab Labs already? Fab Labs are makerspaces. Have you been to the Fab Lab in Barcelona? Maybe just raise your hand. Well, most of you already know what they're like. And if you don't, it's mostly if you want to go somewhere and use digital fabrication machines, you can go to a Fab Lab. Like you can go to a library and read books, you can go to a Fab Lab and use machines. Um, and this is one that is in Iceland. Uh, you can see that from the Center for Bits and Atoms at MIT, we try to facilitate a global network of Fab Labs that is partially managed by Tomas. Uh, and one of the ways in which we facilitate that is by developing open source and easily accessible software for controlling different kinds of digital fabrication machines. So for example, instead of using a milling machine and having to learn the milling machine specific software package, and then when you use a different milling machine, learning a new software package, it's one interface that is the same for all of the machines. And I've been involved in setting up Fab Labs like this with a laser cutter and a milling machine and 3D printers and electronics for doing prototyping um, and uh, communications for talking to other Fab Labs for a very long time. In fact, I've set up Fab Labs um, really all over the world uh, since I started working at MIT in 2009. And while I was it, at MIT, there was a there's just a really large range of people who are interested in digital fabrication. There are, uh, you know, kids who just want to make stuff and machines are exciting. Um, there's also, uh, you know, scientists or Nobel laureates who are interested in using digital fabrication for experiments. The maker movement is partially about excited people making stuff, but it's also somewhat of a policy direction where a lot of people think that the maker movement can rejuvenate manufacturing, low volume production, and uh, really is kind of the future of what manufacturing might look like soon. However, uh, so I think that I have a pretty comprehensive perspective on people who use digital fabrication machines. I have been there when Obama was trying to use a digital fabrication machine. I've played with kids that don't know how to read and write yet who want to use digital fabrication machine. There's like a large spectrum. And this promise of how it's the next digital revolution, or it's the next industrial revolution, digital fabrication is going to change how we make and consume everything. It's a great idea, but there is a disconnect between the reality of production and um, the promise of the production. So the maker movement is really exciting, but in reality it's not necessarily that easy yet or that different yet. Um, and so what I've spent a lot of time working exactly at this intersection where everything is really exciting and futuristic, but at the same time when it comes down to it, and you have to use the machines, and you have to use some old Windows driver to run some old software, and it's all really difficult and terrible. How do you actually make that um, work? One of the things that I originally thought was a problem with Fab Labs is that there's not that many of them. Now there's about 1,000 of them all over the world. Um, but 1,000, there's maybe 1,000 libraries, I think, in Massachusetts alone. So the access to digital fabrication machines is still somewhat limited. So this is a very early project that I worked on uh, with Jonathan Ward, um, thinking about if you have access to a Fab Lab, can you use a Fab Lab to make another Fab Lab? So can you go into a Fab Lab and make the machines that are in the Fab Lab with the machines that exist already in the Fab Lab? Very meta. So this, for example, is a uh, small tabletop milling machine. Uh, so uh, it's made out of cutting boards and it's made for uh, making circuit boards. Um, so you can make it with about $400 worth of parts um, and then use it to prototype milled circuit boards uh, such, as, uh, such as the ones that I'll show you in a second in this somewhat steady cam lacking video. Uh, and uh, at the time, you know, we thought that this would be really great because anyone who wants to make a circuit board such as this one could make, go into a fab lab, make this machine, um, it's open source, and then take it home and then make as many circuit boards as they want to prototype whatever they wanted to do. But the reality was that it was not a very successful project. I made, I don't know, 50 of them, but 
it wasn't a thing that was easy for other people to make. And maybe it was a lack of documentation, but I think it's partially also a lack of flexibility of this machine. It can only really do one thing, mill in this small space. And so unless you have exactly the same application in mind, this application, making circuit boards, um, doesn't necessarily work out that well. And so this machine was too limited for most people, and the amount of time it takes about three days to make, the amount of time that you had to put into it didn't really pay off afterwards, because then even afterwards, it's not a product, so the user experience wasn't well thought out. You had to use the command line to run the machine, all kinds of things that uh, ended up being not, um, not really ideal. So then I started thinking about the origins of digital fabrication equipment. This is, um, this is a milling machine that was photographed at MIT in the 1950s. Uh, it's a, a vertical mill. And uh, this is the first time they connected it to a computer. So at the, at the time, you know, it was right after the Second World War, and digital computers were um, on the rise because computers were needed to calculate artillery firing tables and other war-related things. So there were computers, and milling machines were being used to make um, parts for airplanes and other kinds of tools at the time, and there weren't enough machinists to make all of the parts. To be a machinist, you had to be relatively skilled and expert. So I said, well, why don't we, instead of having an expert machinist who's making all of these parts, try to connect the computer to the machine so that the computer controls the machine, and thus the, the birth of uh, CNC, computer numeric control. Um, and. Uh, that was actually a pretty cool idea because, for example, if you want to do a complex curve, so if you want to do a straight line, that's pretty straightforward. You just go on a straight line. But say you want to do um, a wing and you have to follow the curve of a wing, then interpolating all of the points on that curve is relatively complicated to do by hand. So having a computer do that for you makes a lot of sense. Um, but these machines have actually not changed at all. This is a, sometimes I work uh, with NASA Ames in uh, California, and this is the milling machine that they use to make parts for the International Space Station and other space applications. And if you look at this milling machine, and you look at this milling machine, do you guys notice anything? The photographs are different. One is from the side and one is from the front, but this is actually the same milling machine. It's the same model, Cincinnati Hydrotel number two. Um, and so here, it's hooked up to a computer that runs Windows XP, and here, it's hooked up to one of the first digital computers. And actually, the functionality has not changed that much at all. You write code that generates your toolpath, you send it to the milling machine, and the milling machine executes. And perhaps the applications that you have in mind are not changing that much. You're still making metal parts that need to be precise, and so um, this machine is already evolved to be optimal for its particular application. You know, like the horseshoe crab that hasn't changed in thousands and thousands of years. This machine has reached its optimal point. And to be able to get to that machine, you have all of these different roles. You have the person who is calculating what the design file is, um, figuring out what exactly is the curve that you want. Then you have the person who's trying to express the curve in CAD, so in Rhino or in SolidWorks or in something like that. And then once you have the design file, you have to translate the design file into instructions that the machine understands. And so instead of saying, I need to be at this X coordinate and this Y coordinate, you say something like, move your motors this fast in this direction. And that's how the machine executes. And historically, each one of these actions was represented by a different job. These are all different people who are executing different parts of this labor. And uh, now, uh, that, that just doesn't really exist anymore. Uh-oh. I touched something and killed everything. Ah, sorry. Um, and so the, uh, uh, the, if you go back to this machine, you can see that basically every single role that originally existed, the person who did the CAD drawing, the person who did the CAM, the person who's doing the machine control, I just recreated all of those smaller and cheaper and less precise. And so it's no wonder that it's not a very successful machine because you're not actually bringing more capability, you're just making the same versions. It's not me, it's, I swear. I think it is this, uh, there. <laughs> um, and so the, uh, uh, this problem I think you see uh, 
more often. How many of you have programmed robot arms? Yeah, <laughs> you guys. Um, so a robot arm, so a milling machine is relatively straightforward to program, right? You say, I'm moving in the X, I'm moving in the Y, and I'm moving in the Z. Whereas a robot arm, you have all these joints, right? So you have to say, how much angle is this angle? What's this angle? What's this angle? And so this is the kinematics of the robot arm. So if I say, this is 90 degrees, and this is 90 degrees, and this is 90 degrees, then I know where my hand is, more or less. But say I want my hand to be here, um, and I want to know, therefore, what the position of all of these joints are. That's a slightly more complicated problem because this could be a solution, but this could also be a solution. And so how do you calculate the right joint angles? It's slightly complicated. Um, and so these are students at MIT who are creating their own program for calculating complicated tool paths for the robot arm to cut a surface. They're making like an architectural wall that has kind of undulations on them. And uh, so they've done all of this complicated programming to figure out how the robot arm should move to create exactly the surface that they want. Um, to be able to cut the surface, they have this hot knife at the end of the robot arm. Um, the hot knife has to be a certain temperature to cut the styrofoam. Sorry, it's not a very good picture, but you can see the styrofoam on the right, and if it's hot, you can cut straight through it. Um, but then to integrate the end effector into the robot arm, even though this is ostensibly what these robot arms are designed for, was so much work for this. This is actually on Saturday night at some point, so they're not exactly excited about doing everything correctly. They just want to get it done. Um, to be able to integrate the temperature control into the robot arm, instead of spending time doing that in scripting, even though they're clearly competent at that, they have this other guy on the left with a surge protector, and he's turning it on and off to make sure it doesn't get too hot and then doesn't get too cold. So it's the most expensive control loop. It's the easiest control loop to program. If it's too hot, turn it off. If it's too cold, turn it on. Um, and yet it was so complicated to include it within this whole system that uh, uh, they decided to just do it by hand. And so this is kind of a system integration problem this is kind of a system integration problem that exists uh, with uh, uh, a lot of digital fabrication machines. So unless you're doing exactly what everyone else has done before, milling metal, probably aluminum or maybe titanium on a large milling machine, that needs to be controlled in three axes. Is it because I'm wiggling too much on stage? This, this, ah, uh, yeah. I stay very still. Um, so. This problem of changing the uh, of changing the machine all the time is a uh, is difficult. And so, if you have a different application, like you don't want to make something out of metal, but you want to make something out of uh, plastic, or you want to make a glass thing that then you're going to fill to a certain level, you know, how do you automate totally different kinds of digital fabrication uh, processes? Um, so this is a a machine for exploring. This wasn't exactly thinking about different processes, but this is exploring also. What could um, portable digital fabrication look like? Uh, this is a, um, a project I did with Alain Moyer. And uh, it was, uh, the idea here was, can you bring the whole lab with you? Instead of going to a lab the way you would go to a library, can you take the, can you take the lab with you and uh, have lots of different functionality in one machine? Um, so this is a 3D printer as a head. There is also um, a milling machine head, and a uh, <laughs> there's also a milling machine head and a cutting head, um, uh, and different uh, so that you can do different operations all within the same machine platform. So you can uh, <laughs> you can tell that there is like a X Y Z motion that you might have to do with any end effector, such as a 3D printer. Given that I'm not completely sure how to solve the problem of the video, I'm just ignoring it. But if it gets really annoying, you guys can complain, and I'll, I'll, I'll take a break and try to... Uh... <laughs> I... Glitch art, you guys. This is a totally different kind of talk. <laughs> this thing is also very hot. Maybe that's the problem. Anyway. Uh, so the machine uh, um, 
it's kind of successful, or at least it was a, everyone really likes this machine because it looks sexy and, and you can take it with you on an airplane and you can make things everywhere. But uh, at the same time, you can still only do the same things that digital fabrication machines already can do. So you can 3D print, you can mill. Um, we had a pipetting head that we put on it for a while. And so this is a, still a limitation of saying, okay, I know what you want to automate. You want to automate 3D printing or you want to automate milling and um, that's not really enough. And so together with yet another collaborator, James Coleman, I uh, started working on modular and reconfigurable machine parts so that you could, uh, so that you could make a, your machine have different size work envelopes. Instead of only being able to make parts that exist on inside the space of the briefcase, can you make them bigger and smaller um, and uh, of different sizes? I'm not sure. I can switch to VGA. OK. I also have it on this. Yeah. yeah. Brief intermission, you guys. Ooh. Maybe I can just uh, tell you guys other stories. Meanwhile, they figure that out. Um, this, this system integrates, I can tell you many stories about how things have gone wrong when you were trying to use a machine to do something that it wasn't supposed to do. Cool. Um, for example, you guys know what a wire EDM is? It is a... Uh, electrode discharge machine. So if you ha wanted to cut like a very high piece of metal um, and uh, you wanted to cut it with a completely straight edge, then you can use a wire that you charge and then the wire erodes the metal slowly so that you can cut very precise um, shapes. And uh, we have a wire EDM at MIT. Huh, it's my band. <laughs> I start it? Or it's... Thank you. No, it's not Linux. Linux is great. <laughs> Yeah, let me see if I can go ahead. I may be about... No, no, I got it. Yeah, it's working. No worries. See, we have prevailed with uh, technology. Um, so, Together with James Coleman, I started making modular machines to be able to configure um, machines out of single parts. So for example, if you want um, a bigger part, you can make a bigger machine and just um, click together the parts that you need for that motion. Um, and if you want a smaller machine, you make less. Or if you want a machine that has rotary uh, degrees of freedom and some that have linear degrees of freedom, you can assemble them out of these machine parts. See, all of the music booths here all seem to care a lot about modularity as well. So modularity, I also think, is cool. Um, and uh, this, is, uh, this is similar to the wire EDM I was talking uh, uh, to you about before. So here, if you have four axis control, for example, you make one side of the machine move in a certain way and another side of the machine move in a different way so that you can cut shapes that are, for example, square on one side and round on the other, or that they say hell on one side and yeah on the other. Uh, so the way that um, we made all of these machine parts is so that they fit together easily so that you can assemble them. But the way that you do uh, the machine control for all of these different parts is you typically have to program a single controller board. So this one is, for example, um, available commercially, and it's called a, a Tiny G board. And it has four motor drivers so that you can have a machine up to four degrees 
of freedom. But if you wanted to have, for example, a fifth degree of freedom, if you wanted to add a rotary stage because you wanted to cut helices or something like that, and so I will go back to the, the wire EDM very briefly. So the wire EDM that we have at MIT has a GPS on it because um, if we move the machine, they're afraid that we will sell it to a uh, terrorist or something and that then they will use it to build bombs or nuclear weapons or something like that. So it has a GPS on it so that when we move it, it like shuts down and sends out an alarm and presumably the CEA would show up or something like that. But if you wanted to add, and if you want to add a fifth degree of freedom to your wire EDM, so if you want to be able to cut helices, um, then your machine has to be under even stricter controls. And so uh, then it cannot operate in an open facility like ours at MIT, but it has to be somewhere, um, somewhere where they have some kind of access control uh, that adheres to ITAR regulations. And so here, this limitation of four motors also corresponds to this limitation of not being able to cut helices. But it's not actually that difficult to add more degrees of freedom to a machine. Um, and uh, you know, we wanted to make it even easier because we think that the, the way to regulate people making bad things is not by stopping them from having access to machines that can make bad things, but just by encouraging them not to make bad things. So this is a uh, distributed control system um, that I worked on also with Elon, who I also worked on with a briefcase, um, where instead of having to change a monolithic control board like this every time you change your machine, um, if you wanted to add a fifth degree of freedom or um, another end effector or another control loop, it becomes very simple to add another um, node onto the network. And so in the same way that you would snap different kinds of uh, you know, synthesizer bits with little bits onto your stack, you can do the same thing with, uh, with machine control. Um, and then uh, this is a short technical component of if you have um, your machine specification, you have different motors will have different specifications of how much they turn per step, for example, if it's a stepper motor. Or the stepper motor will be attached to a timing belt, and the timing belt has a certain pitch. Um, with a board like the G-code board, every time you change something about the dimensions of your machine, you have to reprogram the firmware of the G-code board. Um, and that's annoying because sometimes reprogramming uh, firmware is much more complicated than, uh, um, than being able to modify something in a higher level language. And so this is a library that we wrote to be able to specify what a machine is at a high level so that um, as you change your machine, so say I use a timing belt of a certain width at one time and then I change the timing belt to be something else, I only have to change it here in code and I don't have to, um, I don't have to recompile the firmware and reflash the firmware. Um, so schematically you have the machine, then you have the control nodes, then you have the virtual machine object that we wrote in the virtual machine library, and then you have some software application that controls it all. So software we have not talked about yet. With the uh, hot wire cutter that I was showing earlier, we were actually generating all of the coordinates in Rhino. Um, but that, like the, uh, that, like the uh, uh, previous machines from the 1950s, means you write all of the code, then you send the code to the machine, then the machine does it, and you just watch the machine. So there's no interactivity. So that's kind of a problem from the software side. Um, even though we can do maybe more complicated toolpath planning um, if we control it from the software, it still has some limitations. Um, and so imagine you wanted to do something totally different. So this is a loom you know, for uh, weaving. And uh, these are all electromagnets that allow you to select which thread is being lifted and which isn't. You can see that there are um, a lot of different electromagnets. If we had to buy them all, it would have cost us a lot of money to have them custom ordered. And so instead, um, you can make a little machine that runs uh, the, that makes the coils for you. Because the coil is a typical application of something that you need high precision, because it needs to be exactly eight ohms, for example. Um, but you don't necessarily need a whole lot of them. So can you prototype a machine quickly um, to make the highly precise object rather than saying, um, we need one machine that can make almost anything? Because you could, it would be very difficult to make something like this on a 3D printer, for example. Um, and so, uh-oh. Hmm. Maybe I can, when I want to press the thing to play a video, maybe I can just do it over here. <laughs> So 
So maybe if I say, you can just press with the mouse. OK? Here, if I, if I ask you, just press there. Yeah. Or for the next video, yeah. So here, you can imagine that the software controls to be able to do this are very simple. You just say, you know, you have to move this far, and this motor has to rotate at this speed. Um, and it's not something that you necessarily need a whole CAD program for. You just uh, um, you can just quickly prototype it in a script. And so how can you quickly prototype workflows such as this one that don't really have that much to do with traditional fabrication like 3D printing, um, but have uh, more to do with like whatever workflow composition environment you want to uh, um, you want to be able to create. So this is a browser-based, this is also open source work that we've been doing at the Center for Bits and Atoms. So this is a browser-based modular workflow composition environment where you can make um, workflows for different kinds of machines um, by, connecting different, uh, uh, by connecting different modules together. So here's like a simple, I have a black and white image, I'm tracing the outline, and I'm generating a 3D printing tool path from that outline. But then if, for example, you wanted to add um, some kind of feedback, so if you wanted to use, for example, image, uh, if you wanted to use information from the video camera instead of information from a static object, then uh, you can add a video, um, you could add a video module and use the video module to generate the toolpath, uh, etc. And so this is a uh, uh, this is how we are trying to address the problem of software not necessarily being easy to develop for different kinds of custom built machines. Um, These are some examples of machines that um, we kind of configured with these with these uh, modules that we had. So this is a uh, um, this on the bottom right, you see that's a morphing wing geometry, and uh, to be able to uh, test the morphing wing geometry, they needed to have a baseline wing to compare it to, but they forgot to make that. Um, and so we just set our machine up such that it had a six-foot span and cut out their airfoil shape, um, saved their butts in less than an hour. Yeah. <laughs> uh, or uh, this is a project in which, uh, for example, if you want to do um, precise color acquisition. This is a, uh, this is a, a module included for the Canon, um, the Canon automation setup so that you can take pictures of an object as you rotate it and stitch them together to make a color map or to uh, make a 3D map. Um, but this is kind of limited because unless I was going to like kickstart these objects and the control system for everyone to use, this is not an easy way for everyone to make machines. And so, you know, what are we going to do now if we want people to start making these specific custom machines for whatever the application is? How do we make it as easy as possible for people to test that and to start out with that? Um, so I made a kit. This is a cardboard machine kit for people to make. Uh, machines out of machines like the ones that I was showing you before, but just as a cardboard. Um, and so the idea is that in the over the course of one afternoon, you can assemble the machine parts and then um, create the uh, uh, machine to do whatever you want. And then if you first make one thing work, you know how if you want to write a computer program, you first test something really simple and then you make it more complicated? You know, why can't you also not do that with machine development and machine design? Uh, and so, hey, let me go back. Maybe here, press? Yeah. Oh, no, this one. Press here. Yeah. Um, and so this is a, a different machines that maybe you could configure with these uh, 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 this cardboard kit, it's laser cut and then folded. So part of the cardboard is scored and part of it is cut all the way through. And then in, um, so it should take about um, 15 minutes to laser cut the parts and then a few hours to assemble them. This is the network's control board um, that I was showing you earlier. Um, and this is more or less the assembly process. Uh, and we taught this as part of Fab Academy, which is a class that we teach throughout the global Fab Lab network where everyone can make um, machines uh, using this kit. And so now you have, instead of experts that are doing machine design, novices who are making a machine as a one-week assignment for this class. Um, so in different places in the world, everyone made lots of different kinds of machines. And so. Uh, the, uh, this is in Korea, where they made calligraphy machines. A lot of these machines are kind of silly. Um, 
This one is a 3D scanner, so it uses the iPhone for the image capture, but the rest of the motion is all automated by the machine. It's a coffee stirring machine. This is a light show machine. But here, for example, you can see five axis control, like I was talking to before, so, uh, talking about before. So it's not necessarily that difficult to add um, more degrees of freedom to uh, the uh, uh, to the machine environment. Um, I think, yeah, this one is in uh, in Italy. This one is in Japan. And so you can see that also in the range of these machines, that even though a lot of them are kind of frivolous, like cocktail mixers or whatever. It, it's only a one week prototype, right? So if the infrastructure is in place for you to be able to make lots of different kinds of machines from these, um, using these like modular parts, then you can also make it easier to make lots of different kinds of um, machines for more serious applications. That one was obviously also from Japan. The Japanese people are really into making food machines. Um, anyway, I have lots more of these. Uh, maybe you can press it here too. The, the, uh, uh, I think one thing that we tried to do with the kit also is to build affordances into the kit so that you can, for example, change the material that you're working with. So here they moved from cardboard to, uh, to uh, plywood, you can see. This is a printer that prints into bubble wrap, uses the bubble wrap as like a dot matrix. Um, this is a machine I like a lot, I'll talk about more in a second. Uh, but it's also a cardboard machine. So you can see why you would need the precision, but not necessarily why um, you would need a really heavy machine like the Cincinnati Hydrotel that I was showing you before. Uh, and so, you know, where your expertise also lies, you might be able to customize things more. So if you're very good at, um, so these guys are pretty good at kinematics programming, so you, but not necessarily so good at mechanical design. So you can make different parts um, that are more or less relevant to uh, your specific application. Um, this is a machine I want to talk about more specifically. Uh, it's a, uh, the, the group that made it is uh, based in Peru. And maybe press again, I don't know. The, uh, and so they want to be able to assemble structures out of pipes that connect together at different angles. And so the only thing that they need to do is cut this specific pipe. So the whole machine only needs to have a connection point that makes sense for this stock that they're using. And they can prototype the entire machine for less than $100, making it out of partially 3D printed parts and partially cardboard. Um, and the structural loop that they have to cut the, uh, the pipe is actually very small. So a structural loop is if you have a robot arm and it has to do something very precise all the way over here, it tends not to have high precision. Whereas if you have a structural loop that's very small like this, then you can have higher precision. Um, so I thought it was a really clever way that they solved that. I'll skip this one. Um, this one press again. Uh, so this is uh, another machine from Japan about food. Um, and this is a daikon radish. They called their machine consider. Uh, and this machine, I also like their documentation of it a lot because you can see throughout their video how, the, how they did different iterations of the machine. So they already know how to 3D print more or less, and they have this attachment for the radish, and they're moving back and forth, and they even know how to do some kind of web or even app um, programming. So they have their little cute peel the radish thing, but then they make a cutter that doesn't work at all. And they're like, okay, the cutter has to be made out of metal after all. Um, and then they here now they learn about the difference between you know running friction and starting friction. So at first like the, you can't really cut the peel, um, but then they're like, oh wait, wait, we have to. This is how we have to start the machine. And so you can see that they're learning about the machine development process as they're doing it. Um, and so the 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 way that you can then have kind of a feeling of success as you develop the machine is a uh, um, I think really important because otherwise I think a lot of this kind of automation. Um, takes too much time and you end up not doing it at all. Uh, and, uh, you know, similarly, oh wait, here, pray, play this one. Similarly, these people, um, they didn't really care that much about um, what the machine looked like, but they wanted a machine that they could bring anywhere um, and assemble it onto a whiteboard. And so they spent a lot of time figuring out how to do the kinematics for a, um, a, a a robot that hangs from two strings. So unlike 
uh, the kinematics for a robot arm, the strings can, take, can change length. And so when you describe the motion of a robot arm, you can do it with, matrixes, with matrices in linear algebra. But if you're trying to describe a transform like this, it's a nonlinear transform, so you can't do it with linear algebra. Um, and they spend a lot of time developing code for that particular code base. So you can see that they didn't necessarily do anything too complicated for their machine, but they did contribute back um, to the infrastructure that allows other people to make these kinds of uh, machines. And so if we look back then at this, the Cincinnati Hydrotel, you know, this really doesn't do any of the things that all of those machines that I showed you um, do. So if you wanted to precisely apply ketchup to an omelet, it would take you a long time to hack this machine to do that correctly. And you know, why is that? Why do we need to have only this have access to precision as opposed to any kind of other machine? Um, and because I work a lot with machines and electronics, I spend a lot of time in China in places like this where you can go to a marketplace and have all kinds of different things made. Like you go in and you want a potentiometer that'll change color as you turn it and uh, they'll make you different colors on the spot. Or it's like a very fluid manufacturing landscape. Um, and these are phones that you can buy. I collect these phones. They're uh, uh, about $15 each, um, and they each are like their own crazy design. So on the bottom right, it's an iPhone clone that runs Android, or at the top, it's like a phone that is made to look like an Hermes handbag, or uh, on the top left, that's like a gold necklace phone that has like the Lamborghini logo on it, but says Prashi. I mean, it's very cool. <laughs> but, uh, you know, this is a if, the, if what we're going for next is uh, um, the possibility for manufacturing to produce these things in low volume, because this is not like, none of these phone manufacturers are like, we're the next iPhone, we're going to send millions and millions of the pig-shaped phone. But um, they're still able to really quickly turn out these products. And so if uh, machines, if it's easy for you to prototype machines to make different kinds of products like that, what does that mean for the manufacturing landscape in the future? Is it really going to look like Fab Labs, where there are six machines that supposedly can do almost anything, but actually can't do all that much? Um, in the United States, manufacturing is a hot topic with a new administration. And, uh, you know, much more than any other size, manufacturing firms have less than four employees. And so um, there are in the United States, at least, there are like 100,000 operations where it's less than four people running a water jet or less than four people running some kind of mill. And so if automation gives all of those people precision, what is that going to look like? What, what is, how is that going to change the landscape of the possibilities for the products that we can uh, produce? And so right now, you know, we still kind of enact these historic roles by using different software every time um, we're doing something different in digital fabrication. But actually, you know, if you walked up to the Fab Lab now, you would be all of these people. You would be performing all of these roles. And so what are the roles going to look like in the future when we have to automate more personalized and different kinds of things? Um, I think that it would be cool, for example, if you design something that the machine that needed, you needed to make that thing was automatically generated on another seat another screen on the side. So you're designing a part and your machine is automatically being generated and all you have to do is assemble it. Um, and you know, if everyone is making everything everywhere all the time, how do you trust that a product is going to do the right thing? Uh, these are all kind of research questions that I think about. But, you know, it's hot, so that's all for now. I would uh, like to thank you for coming. <laughs> and I can, uh, I can answer questions. I can answer questions if anyone has questions. He will give you a microphone. Um, yeah, this is really cool. Nice talk, thanks. Thanks. Um, I'm wondering if you guys have done any work with using recycled materials in, in oh, definitely. home manufacturing. Let's uh, totally. So uh, previously, before I started working specifically on um, uh, digital fabrication, I was focused on um, composite materials and specifically biodegradable composite materials that are strong and light. And I think that one of the difficulties about any kind of recycled material is characterization. And so no one ever wants to use recycled materials because maybe you get 
you know, one palette of something, and then you can't characterize the material properties very well. You'd much rather go to a supplier where you're going to be able to go every single time and buy exactly the same thing. So once you have tuned your manufacturing process, it's going to work the same way each time. Um, and one of the things that I think is sort of slowly happening, and if we work on it, making it a little bit more system integratable might happen faster is how do you include instrumentation and sensing all the way through the manufacturing process so that the way that you develop a successful manufacturing process is not I made it with this one material and it worked when I did all these things and I don't remember exactly how that was but I'm just gonna do it the same way every time so that my yield is high instead um, you kind of learn with the material. I think that that's kind of necessary to be able to convince, especially manufacturers that are working at higher volumes, to use materials that have these sort of precarious supply chains, such as recycled materials. Um, but that's a, I think it's like, that's, that's my answer to the question. Coming from a technical perspective, I think that there's also policy ways in which you can mandate it. For example, um, in the EU, I think, two or five percent of all automobiles have to be made out of post-consumer recycled material. And so then all of a sudden, all the manufacturers just figured out how to work with it, you know? So there are different ways you can solve that problem. No more questions. Cool. Let's all dance. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Thank you.